Hi, I'm Stanley Malloy. I'm here at the AAAS meeting in Washington, D.C. We're interviewing today Professor Stephen Morse. He's a professor of epidemiology at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University. And Steve is an expert on ways of rapidly detecting infectious disease pandemics before they happen. So he's also the director of the USAID program to uh, for rapid detection of pandemic disease. So, Steve, could you Thank tell you. us a little bit about how this works? What, what What's the new approach for detecting these infectious diseases so that we can be prepared before the outbreak? Well, for a number of years, all of us have been working on emerging infections and worrying about the possibility of new infectious diseases coming into the human population. You know, have been saying that we really need to have good early warning systems and uh, various um, efforts have been made in the past. USAID, the Agency for International Development, very much uh, to its credit, I think I'm delighted to be a part of it, rose to the occasion and decided to start a new program called Emerging Pandemic Threats, of which our project, PREDICT, is a part of it. And the goal really is to build the capacity for being able to identify infectious diseases in nature before they become human health threats. So there are a number of ways you can think about that. One of the things we've recognized with emerging infections over those that appear unexpectedly and seem to be sudden, like uh, HIV AIDS or SARS or a, an influenza pandemic, these emerging infections, many of them come from other species. So they're already in the environment or close relatives are already there. So the first thing is to be able to see them out there and identify them out there in the environment. The second requirement then is to be able to report quickly so you know that something's happening. So first you have to recognize something unusual, then you have to be able to report it. And I think the tools have improved in the last 20 years since we've started worrying about this problem considerably. And, and that gives me hope that, that actually we may be getting closer to a solution to this problem and that I think USAID has really done a, a great thing in uh, supporting these efforts. But we see a number of surveillance efforts. So the first thing is to look for unusual outbreaks of infectious diseases. Now we have molecular methods and other methods by which you can actually do what some of my colleagues call pathogen discovery. You can go out there and find what's what uh, microbes are in other animals or in the environment. And then, of course, the challenge is to figure out which of them are likely to come into the human population and become threats. You can obviously also be vigilant for the outbreak of human disease, and we've had a, a number of those. You think about SARS, for example, the last influenza pandemic. Um, but one example is H5N1, the bird flu, which got a lot of attention but it caused a small outbreak in 1998 in Hong Kong, uh, and that got everyone's attention just because it was so unusual for that particular variety of influenza virus to cause human disease. And then we sort of forgot about it, which I think was a mistake. We really should have been watching uh, and, and doing these things. And then suddenly it, it burst forth again with renewed vigor uh, first as a poultry disease in uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, in 2003, and then there were some human cases. Luckily, it hasn't really taken wing, forgive the pun, and uh, become a human-to-human -human transmission. If it did, then of course it, it would be a very serious concern as a pandemic influenza, but people continue to watch that. But that gives you an example of the fact that many of the emerging viruses of the future and emerging infections of the future are already out there in nature, so we need to know about them, and then we need to be able to do some risk assessment, and that, I think, is the challenging part. And then, of course, to be able to report more rapidly when these things happen. With SARS, for example, it, when they first saw cases in Hong Kong, if more people had been aware of that problem, it might not have spread as far as it did, and it might not have made it to Toronto, we hope. Uh, it was stopped through a lot of public health and other efforts, but could it have been stopped earlier if we'd been paying attention more closely, and I think it's possible. Now we have cell phones, we have the internet, and we have other tools by which we can not only identify these pathogens, but also we can, um, we can manage to report more rapidly. Right. And, right. Remote parts of the world. Now, that's a really Im 
important change that a lot of people don't think of when they think of epidemiology is how it's something as simple as cell phone technology and the ability to send text messages and email can really impact the early detection and identification of disease. Could, could you give us an example of where that's been used and what the impact has been? Sure, there are a number of places where, where this technology has been used, but there was a recent um, outbreak of um, unknown uh, deaths and, you know, deaths due to an unknown cause in Uganda, and a number of different um, uh, technologies were used to report those. Um, now, one possibility is that that could be yellow fever, although there may be other things as well, but that spurred uh, a large immunization program now to get started just, just recently, just at the end of January, uh, to immunize that population against yellow fever, which may be endemic in that area, and which is one of those infections that is still a problem, but we often forget about it, because we can get our vaccine, and there is a good vaccine, but where it's endemic in many parts of Africa, it's not. So when there's an outbreak, and there isn't enough capacity in the world, quite frankly, to produce vaccine for everyone, even if we wanted to give it and had the logistics to give it to everyone. So there, um, having rapid reporting would be very successful in helping to target the appropriate intervention. So that was one example, those deaths in Uganda. More recently, there have been a number of deaths in Bangladesh that were reported quite rapidly, probably due to Nipah virus, which is carried by bats, but has been seen in Bangladesh. And there again, control measures to make sure that people aren't spreading it to others in hospitals, for example, through accidental contamination or um, in uh, agricultural settings uh, can be done to help protect people and prevent the outbreak from spreading further. So there are some initial successes that you can point to, but there's a lot of potential for this to be expanded and have a much greater impact in the future? I think this is really just in its early stages. I mean, for over 20 years, I think going back to the first meeting on emerging viruses that um, the late John LaMontagne and I organized at, uh, for National Institutes of Health, National uh, Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and the Fogarty International Center. Uh, that was held in Washington in 1989. And, and since then, I think everybody who's been working in this area has been calling for the need for surveillance. There was an Institute of Medicine report in 1992, another one about 10 years later. All of them called for improved surveillance, early warning, and appropriate response to uh, new outbreaks of infectious diseases. And I think we're finally at the stage where we may have the tools to be able to do this effectively, but we're really in the very early stages uh, because, um, you know, really, although we've been calling for this for a long time, people have been asking for this for a long time, uh, it's really just, just gotten started in recent years on, on a larger scale. Well, Steve, this is a great example, I think, of what people have been talking about for a long time, about interdisciplinary science. What you said is it, you have to have a foundation in understanding the organisms that cause disease, in the medicine, uh, but also in an understanding of in the environment and in animal disease, as well as uh, things like mobile phone technology, satellite imaging, and a lot of other aspects that go into being able to localize and respond to the problem quickly. I think that's an excellent point. Who would have thought that advances in computer technology and advances in you know, what we call inf bioinformatics and uh, biocomputing would have a radical effect and advances in communications would have a tremendous effect in improving our capabilities to deal with new and unexpected infectious disease outbreaks. Thank you very much, Thank Steve. Thank you, Stan.